freaking what up, dude? Um, it's Carter Wilson, and I'm the host of this podcast that's mine. going to be called History is Nice. History is nice. Friggin what up dude welcome back to another ep of history is dank i'm your host strider wilson we got aaron on the sticks what up aaron what up it's chilling dude we got a guest coming on today nate dern writes for a little show called fallon maybe you heard of it the freaking tonight show dude legendary epic nate is a freaking dank dude um he's a fantastic runner he has um You know, I don't want to get into his stats yet, but he's got some good, good 10K time, okay? And I can only imagine, you know, it gets better as less and less mileage. So I think in the um, interest of time and everything, and to keep things rolling, we'll play around with the format now. Maybe I'll do a little personal history at the end after some cues. But let's um, let's dial Nate up and let's start talking. Today we're going to be talking about the uh, history of running, dude. And we're going to do a special focus on a legend, dude. Because, you know, I love freaking legends, dude. Freaking Steve Prefontaine. Dude's a beast. Freaking straight up beast, dude. And we're going to talk about... Honestly, I didn't even know that much about him. Watched a few movies, dude. So, freaking get into it. Nate, what's up, dude? Hey, Strider. How's it going? Fantastic, man. First of all, thank you so much for joining today. Freaking honored to have you on the pod, dude. Thanks for having me. I'm a huge fan of history. Happy to be here. Love that. And you actually turned me on to our subject for today. Um, We're going to be talking about Steve Prefontaine and, uh, you know, a little bit about his outing at the uh, 72 Munich Games, maybe a little bit about that. But, um, man, I what a legend, dude. What a what a just a great dude and and totally an inspiration for all work. And I think you're a comedy writer and I think. You know, there's a lot to be, I think, some similarities in his path of, like, how he had to hustle, go against the uh, athletic association, and grind to sort of chase down his dreams. And it's something that you're, did you grind, you know, to work your way up to the position you are now, writing for The Tonight Show and Fallon? Yeah, it feel it feels like that. I I grew up uh, running and doing long distance running on the track team in college, and I always felt like there was a spiritual brotherhood between comedy and distance running. Also, just all the uh, all the long distance kids, you know, the cross country kids in high school were always just a bunch of goofs. Like he, mm-hmm. they're always just kind of had a sillier yeah. attitude on life. I found so there was always a an overlap there. And yeah, just something about there might be a parallel between willing to just get up and go for a run every day, and similar to trying to write every day until you until you get to where you're trying to get to. One hundred percent. I mean, open mic scene. Pretty tough, pretty brutal. <laughs> What's more difficult? You know, that last leg of your 10K or just <laughs> sitting through it? I mean, some of the worst times, man. I mean, I'm out here Ooh, in Burbank. Great question. And, yeah, what do you, you think is worse? I mean, it's just a different, different taxing, but in different ways. Both tests of endurance, yeah. for sure. <laughs> both, both grueling. Uh, both you'll get through them a little bit better if you've had your Gatorade before, you know, make sure you're up on your electrolytes before you hit those open mics. And it also helps if you're like in New York or somewhere and you're trying to get around to four or five open mics in one night, you're going to have to be doing some running. So I think even in a practical way, one, uh, one can help the other. That's a good call. You know, especially if you're, <laughs> you know, if it's lottery system, you're going to skip that. But if it's first come first serve, and you got a good 10k time like you do. <laughs> Let's look. I don't. I don't want to brag. I was gonna brag earlier before you came on. I was like, you guys don't even know who I've got. Got Nate Dern, comedic beast, dude, freaking beast mode runner. I mean, do you want me to say what your time is? Because it's, it's, I was, it's pretty I would love legit, it dude. It's pretty legit. <laughs> All right, Nate Dern has clocked a time of 37 10k. Which is a five fifty nine, okay, five minute, fifty nine second mile pace. That's it's all right. That's beastly. It's all right. I just saw in the news that a uh, a pregnant lady just ran like a five twenty mile. Uh, she only did one mile, but she's like nine months pregnant, and she just ran a five twenty mile. Have you seen that? It's like a viral no. story this week. 
That's where, uh, her husband bet her a hundred dollars that she couldn't run an eight minute mile a week before her due date, which seems kind of like a reckless, <laughs> a reckless bet. Yeah. But she did it. She crushed it. She ran like a very fast mile. What a sub beast. six minute mile. Did she, they should like give her shave some time off. I mean, she's running for two there and it's like, <laughs> exactly. And it should, it should count for half the time. Yeah, yeah exactly. You got to cut it right in half. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. And because I was looking at some of these world records and stuff, just because I was looking at Prefontaine's times and everything, and they do account for when you're running in altitude and everything. And did you did you grow up in an altitude environment? Did you know? Did that have any play into it, or even for our listeners, like what is? For me, I have a little bit of an understanding with, as far as like you know, we don't need to get into conspiratorial blood doping, although that's not conspiratorial, <laughs> but like we don't need to go down that avenue. But what's the advantage or disadvantage? You know? Yeah, there's always like an asterisk on if a record happened at altitude, ultimately they give it to whatever is faster, but then it's kind of like a head nod, like, oh, and he, you know, he ran that in Mexico city or he ran that in Denver, which is a higher altitude. It's just, there's like the, the simple explanation of it is that there's less oxygen in the air. So you're getting less oxygen, which is the fuel that your blood's using uh, to pump, to get you around the track. So it's just like, it's like uh, the difference between putting like uh, 93 <laughs> gasoline into your car versus like 89 or something. Like it's a small difference, but if you're doing uh, enough miles, it'll you'll notice like a few seconds per mile. It all. Um, I think up. I've heard I've heard people quote anywhere from like five to ten second difference. So for a while, when I was in high school, I used to mentally I'd be like, well, my fastest mile time is this, but if I would have run it at sea level, it could have been this. So I would kind of compare that when I was comparing myself to like the other good high school runners, but I, I think I've, I've let that go. <laughs> <laughs> no, believe me, I still live in it. I think about my old volleyball days and like my, my calves will start sweating. I'll be like, dang, <laughs> I should have read that. If I just dove, we might've had, our team might've had a chance. I still think about this to this day. Like if a guy cuts me off on traffic or I feel disrespected by basically any human, I'll immediately go back to, you know, in my time. And being a runner, you know, you spend a lot of time in your dome. I think that's why you're an introspective, smart guy thinking about history. I mean, what is the, what exactly this is a little tan, not tangential, but I know I'm, I'm coming at you hot. Um, I'm just fired up. What is the runner's high sensation? I always hear about this of like, is it just like after a good lift, you just feel stoked? Like what type of stoke is that? Yeah, I think it's similar to a good lift. I think probably physiologically it can be ex- explained very simply, just like, whatever that endorphin boost is that happens when you exercise, you just feel a little bit better. Mm -hmm. I think some people think it might be more than that. Like there's this psychological state known as flow. I hear it talked about, um, which sometimes you can hear described as like when you're in the zone Mm -hmm. and it's just kind of like when you're prepared for something and then you're just in that optimal state of where it's a challenge, but not too hard. So you feel like you can just keep doing it forever and you can kind of just like space out and be in the zone. So that's what I find to be a runner's high. It definitely doesn't happen every time. Um, but every once in a while I just be like, Oh, I'm feeling good. I'm moving kind of fast, feels smooth, feels easy. I could do this forever. And you, you know, hopefully you're not thinking about Twitter or whatever dumb stuff you're normally worried about. You can kind of just zone out and be in that moment. And that's what it's all about. Just super, super present. It's the best. Um, Prefontaine did that. He, he feels like he's more of like a sea biscuit type guy where he would get off on, um, you know, seeing his other runner eye to eye. And like that, that was really the essence of his eye. He is. Yeah. He's interesting. Cause he, I like look up to him so much. And when I was in high school on the team, you know, I had like every book I could find about Prefontaine and I had a bit, I had a poster of him in my high school bedroom that said a quote of his, or at least one that's attributed to him. That was something like, the best pace is a suicide pace and today is a good day to die. Just right. like <laughs> very hardcore <laughs> stuff. And he like in those Prefontaine movies that we were talking about, yeah. he has like, there's two feature films about him and then there's a documentary about him. And there's like an anecdote when he was doing a charity race and a little kid yeah. was about to win the race. And then he like shoves the kid aside and beats him. Cause yes. he's like, you can't let a losing mentality set in. So it's, he's a very hardcore guy which I'm not at all. So it's funny that I like him so much. I kind of like, there's something about that that I respect, but I'm much more of kind of the Zen runner, like uh, getting into the zone rather than this other type of runner, which is like, you know, yeah, dominate your enemies, show them no mercy, that type of thing. Push yourself harder. Pain is only, you know, 
pain as weakness leaving the body, like that type of thing, which I think he he definitely oh, had a lot of that. That's his mantra. That's like, I love in the, yeah. um, I think it's in the Leto one. And they have that scene in the Jared Leto one, which is just called Prefontaine. Then there's a Billy Crudup yeah, yeah. one, which is, I think, without limit or limits. That's right. And um, and we can talk a little bit more about that. But like, they, they do have that scene where he like punks the nine-year-old and then his girlfriend's like, <laughs> his girlfriend's like, why'd you do that? And he just yells at his girlfriend and Betty's like, I've been picked on my whole life. Do you understand? And you're like, everyone does need their drive. Like we do need that. Like I was just, you know, talking about losing high school volleyball or like, and he was kind of a smaller guy. He talks about how he didn't have, you know, a runner's body, a longer limb. And like, so he like really just had to, um, get after it. So it is, it is pretty gold to just see that mentality come out of him and just what a, what a freaking beast this guy is, dude, which I loved as opposed to yeah, the crud up I, performance, the crud up one, he's beastly, but he's almost just like, he can do no wrong in that movie. I, I, I have to say, if I'm picking, let me ask you first. Which one do you like more? First, that, just so I know. I, you please I, say whatever you were gonna say. I love both. I think and the first time I watched them, I liked Prefontaine more. Watching them again, a little older, I think I liked Without Limits a little better. Like it felt a little artsier. And then there's also this documentary called Fire on the Track that Prefontaine pulls from really strongly, like a lot of the talking heads, like when it's Ed O'Neill kind of remembering yeah. what Prefontaine was like. A lot of those are like verbatim from the documentary, which is interesting. So that one might be more accurate. I'm not sure. I felt um, like, I agree. Yeah, what I, do you think? I, could, I got that essence. I haven't seen the documentary, but they kind of do like a documentary style film. Yeah, yeah. Like a dramatic film. It was. It's kind of weird. I don't know. I'm trying to think of another movie that I've seen kind of like that. Like, um, it's pretty bizarre. Like, maybe yeah, they did that with it's not Anatomia. a mockumentary, but like a a serious fake documentary. Yeah, it's weird. Yeah, exactly. And I kind of wish that they didn't do that in it and just kept it more scripted. But uh, I do think Prefontaine was a little more accurate. And at least dove into like it dove into the Munich stuff a lot more. It, it lets you see like how it kind of affected him and some other athletes, um, which is so crazy. Uh, which if any listeners, you know, we got a lot of young stokers listening, Nate. So maybe a lot of them, and I have to admit, I wasn't familiar with, with Prefontaine. I know I have a, a good buddy of mine um, who actually made the intro song for the podcast. Austin is a big runner. Um, oh, cool. And he loves Prefontaine. So he, and uh, that's the only time I've ever heard the name and then was with you. And I'm so happy that, um, to learn about him and everything. And uh, I think what, what I was talking about was just laying out maybe the Munich Olympics a little bit and people kind of don't know 1972. And I did a little bit of research in this, but there were some, um, I forget the name of the terror group that uh, they like raided the oh, Israeli yeah. um, com the Israeli athletic f um, compound where all the athletes were saying like an Olympic village and held some hostage. They shot like a wrestler dude, like, almost took one of the um, terrorists down. He got killed and maybe you can expand yeah, a little bit. No, yeah, it's terrible. It's this amazing sports story where this like horrible thing is happening. Yeah, like these terrorists have taken people hostage, but it's also at the same time, it's this event that all of these athletes have been training for their entire lives. And for a lot of them, it's like their one chance to do something great. And so they're trying to stay in the zone and stay focused on their event while this horrible thing is happening. Um, and like Prefontaine is one of the people whose race was disrupted because of this. And so, yeah, it's just kind of a crazy moment in sports history of the the confluence of politics and sports coming to coming together. Um, and it's yeah, it's like if it wasn't for this this movie, I probably wouldn't have even heard of it either. And just kind mm -hmm. of a ridiculous thing that it happened. Yeah, it's nuts, and it's um, yeah. The only they did they did Spielberg make a movie Munich about it? He yes, it, yeah. Which I I think I remember seeing that. And in that's high school. specifically about that. That focuses in on that event specifically. Yep. Whereas the Prefontaine movie, it's just like one mentioned in one scene. Exactly, um, and in Without Limits, yeah. they kind of mow past it. But in Without Limits, Donald Sutherland, who plays Bill Bowerman, the inventor of Nike. Uh, which is another cool aspect, like so much cool stuff going on in Oregon in the seventies. Yeah. It's crazy. And, uh, he has a great speech though, where he's just kind of like, they're talking about maybe canceling the games. They, they did end up in 1972, like suspending gameplay for one day in honor of the fallen athletes and then picked it back up. Cause it's like, you're saying, I mean, you can't let these individuals dictate what the rest of society right. does. So, you know, you can't, you can't, we can't make decisions based on a small group of, you know, assholes that did right. what they did and so i think bowerman's sutherland's uh bowerman's 
is a much more like gentle character. Whereas like the dude from yes. um, <laughs> in in uh, Prefontaine, I love that actor. What's his name? He's literally from uh, Full Metal Jacket. Yes, uh, the like drill sergeant uh, Lee Emery, I think his name Lee is Emery. something like that. Yep. Yeah, you know that he was on set. That's Kubrick, right? And he was on set to like um, consult with an actor they hired to play the drill sergeant. But Lee Emery was drilling it so hard, Kubrick was like, "You're out." You're I've out. heard that. Yeah, I and, love that. And who? Which which director is it that said the thing like where actors are just cattle or something like that? Oh, I'm not sure, but yeah, that's so funny. It might have been Kubrick. It might have been who's the um, Aaron? Do you know who that was? Um, I want to say it was. Or they're they're not cattle. They're furniture. Furniture. That might have. Uh, I think it might have been Truffaut or something like that. Who's the guy that directed Birds? Is that Kubrick as well? Hitchcock. I think it was Hitchcock. Oh, uh, yeah. Was Hitchcock. That would make sense. Also, Nate, this is Aaron, dude. What up? Hey, Aaron. What up? I don't run. <laughs> Aaron does softball. He, he pulls down championships in softball, though. Yeah. Freaking well, beast, gotta, dude. You got to run around the bases when you're hitting home runs in softball, I imagine. Yes, yes. Uh, much like a kind dwarf. Vic- much like a victory du- trot. Much like a dwarf in Lord of the Rings, I am good at, <laughs> over, over short distances, but... <laughs> uh, yeah, nothing more. Have you seen both of these films, Aaron? Have you seen Prefontaine and have, have you seen no, Without not, Limits? I've not seen either one. Give them a watch. I'm I'm very happy I watched both, and like the vibe is cool. Um, I don't know which one Prefontaine came out. Was it before or after? Um, freaking um, what's the? T- I can't believe I'm blanking on the Tom Hel- Hanks movie Zemeckis. Freaking Forrest Gump, another movie that involved running. I think Forrest Gump, I think, is 95, and then Prefontaine's 97. Okay. It had an older feel to it for me. Had an older, o- I know. older feel. Yeah, yeah. It does. Yeah, it's very funny that they that those movies both came out at all. Like that, I don't think America was like clamoring for two movies yeah. about middle <laughs> distance runners from the totally. early 70s, and not only for one, but two feature films. It's kind of like the, um, the Deep Impact and Armageddon uh, phenomenon, Correct. but for... Correct. distance running in the 70s <laughs> like why are these movies happening right now like i feel like studios just respond to each other like one made money and then the execs were like we're, we're making one let's go we're going prefontaine yeah. and uh i just want to give this a little bit quick mention was just happy to see jared leto not be that weird you know i was right. like this is before he's weird yeah, I, I, kind of I, just his most grounded performance I've ever seen. Totally, and his performance is great. I think I love Crudup. You know, I mean, almost famous. Yeah. Come on, the guy's a beast, dude. Freaking Doctor Manhattan. But it's like, I just think I appreciate it seeing Leto and and his the way his character or Prefontaine was written in Prefontaine gave him more to do. Like Billy Crudup yeah. is angelic in in Without Limits, and that's kind of just it the whole time. And he's like, I'm gonna win. I'm gonna. It's like kind of like a Mel Gibson role with like his character, his only character's flaws is that like he loved his wife too much. Like, <laughs> right. It's like this is my bad. Like I fucking love my wife and freedom a lot. So those are my flaws and I'm going to die because of it. So, okay. You know, like <laughs> Patriot Benjamin Martin, I don't want to fight, but now that the British are here and I believe in honor and freedom, I'm going to have to take you guys out. All right. <laughs> like any Russell Crowe role as well, you know, totally. Yeah. <laughs> Unreal. So, Here's something that, just speaking back on the Olympics real quick, did you know where the 1968 Olympics were? Quick trivia. Love hitting my my bros with some trivia. 1968 Olympics. Where's that? They were in Mexico City. So at Uh, altitude. So you got to adjust for some times there. We're at altitude. But this was not known at Mexico City. And a reason that like the Munich, um, that tragedy happened where the terrorists were able to get into the compound was in large part due to what happened in the 68 games where... Um, there was like students protesting about something and the government, uh, the Mexican military or like a government f- faction of the military or police or something like that gunned down like a lot of students. And they had a very, uh. they had a very heavy militaristic, um, presence at the games and it was kind of noted. And so Munich in 72, and of course, after world war two, the, the Olympic games previous to that were of course at, in Nazi Germany. And I think like, what was it? 36 or something like that. Yeah. And, you know, um, so they wanted to very much have a different vibe. They didn't choose Berlin because that was, of course, you know, still divided at the time. And they chose, chose Germany, chose Munich. Oh, this is a cool city. It's going to sort of rebrand Germany. And they decided to really dial back police presence. They didn't oh, want Oh, I didn't know that. Wow. And if you watch the movies, they kind of like roughly brush over it a little bit. We're like, yeah. And without limits, Bowerman's like, hey, get some Marine guards down here. 
And then like, that's, oh. that's the scene. And they're so, and they even had like a, con, um, they do like um, consult scenarios, security consult scenarios. And this dude who worked on it had like, a, he's like situation 21 is what it was called. And he literally had it to a T where he's like at 5 a.m., some radical um, Middle Eastern terrorists could come in and like storm the compound and like with like seven to eight gunmen. He's like, this could be a, a very, very likely scenario. And that happened. Situation 21. Yeah. So that's crazy. So totally gnarly. Also, good title for a movie. Situation 21. Come on. It is. Yeah. You got to give me that. Sh- shivers down my spine. I'm, I want to see that movie. Wow. It's crazy. And so. Just, that's just a little bit about the Olympics and, you know, that tragedy. Yeah, good history. Good history tidbit. Thank you. Had to do my research. But the best part of the research was, like, watching those movies. I was like, dude, this is great. This could just be my job. This would be, you know, part of doing comedy. Like, if I can get paid to write jokes. Much, much respect for watching two movies. I appreciate it. Oh, I loved it. Are you kidding me? It was it was true pleasure. And um, what was I going to say? Uh, I wanted to talk about a little bit about, and maybe this is part of what we love so much about Pre, um, as he's called if you watch the movies pre pre go pre yep um it's just kind of how he stands up for what he believes in like he he runs to win he's a front runner and then maybe you can expound upon this but the um governing body was like the what was it the atu or something like that the amateur AAU. yeah the amateur athletics association maybe aau maybe yeah, yeah. a bunch of schmoles these guys dude so maybe you can um delve into that a little yeah, bit yeah it's this like funny uh, nuance of that the Olympics were originally imagined as amateur athletes, and it used to be very important that it was amateur athletes competing. Um, and so at the time, you weren't allowed, if you were competing in the Olympics, you couldn't get paid to appear at an event, or you, like Pre, couldn't be paid to go run at a track meet even when he was in college, which he was kind of like, yeah, oh, this is bullshit. Like, people are paying tickets, and I don't get a cut of it. Mm-hmm. which, you know, is like a debate that college athletes still face today, that totally. they're bringing in millions of dollars for their universities and they're not allowed to get paid. Wow. And then, so of course, there's kind of all this like weird side stuff that happens with people finding loopholes and gifts. And so I think actually uh, Pre ended up getting some like very early merch from a very early Nike, which like you said, was founded by Bill Bowerman. Mm-hmm. He had like a small company called like Blue Ribbon Sports or something like that. And then Phil Knight came along and kind of helped him turn that into Nike and then obviously became this empire. Mm-hmm. But at the time it kind of revolutionized like running shoes and turning that into just jogging into like more of a big running phenomenon. Um, and I think they ended up giving Pre some like free shoes or something like that. And then they, the, uh, AAU wanted to penalize him and like find him and threaten that he wouldn't be able to compete and really just seemed to kind of just be like all these guys on a power trip yeah, trying to take down this guy that was like very poor living in his trailer just trying to compete for his country and just like something about this doesn't feel right like even if that is the rule it, then it shouldn't be the rule we should change something and totally. he like he stood up to them and was penalized for it um, but kind of helped call attention to this thing that before then hadn't been questioned in a big way. And it's so weird. It's, it's such kind of strange backwards thinking because they show them living in Olympic village and like them traveling around to amateur events. And it's like, dude, these guys are athletes. Like they need to get, have access to good food and like quality sleep and they're right. not getting any of it and still competing at a high level, which is really impressive. So yeah, it's, it's pre that kind of called attention to that. And I think they ended up switching it in like 78 or in 1980, yeah. I think maybe or 78, they made a rule where Congress said like athletes will have more of a say in in the the way their sports are managed, which was good. So he yeah exactly. Change. And I think he got a he was a big part in making that happen. And then you know because of pre, we got the dream team in uh, the early 90s. We totally had professional basketball players playing in the Olympics. We wouldn't have had that without pre. 100. percent Conversely, <laughs> conversely, we did get the miracle though because there was no pro athletes oh. playing it with the miracle on ice. So, and Great that was point. like in what, 80 something, but yeah. I'm taking dream team all day, Nate. There's no question. Yeah. Give me the dream team. I'll take Kurt Russell's performance in miracle. Another Thank you. Another great sports movie. Another great sports movie. A fantastic. Like if you're a substitute teacher and you're listening and you're like, what am I going to do in class today? You're picking pre, <laughs> you're picking miracle, you're picking Rudy. I mean, come on. The, this is, these are the movies you're putting on. Start with those. If you still have some time to fill Throw on Ted Lasso. Yep. Do yep. The, uh, the I'm here. TV. I'm hearing a lot of uh, great pre- stuff. Are you I liking that? Yeah, are you we, liking we Lasso? It. We finished it. It was great. 
Nice. Another dude. just like great sports comedy. It makes you like he's a he's a very like sweet coach. Not like the um not the pre mentality of winning at all costs. He's more about like, well boys, let's just get out there and do our best and grow as people. <laughs> like love it. That type of thing, which I which I appreciate. All right. Question. Totally tangential. Best coach you've seen in something, film, television, whatever, go. Don't have you actually don't have to go that quick because I'm thinking about a second too. Aaron, I want you to weigh in on this too. I'm thinking one of my favorite coaches. Mm, I mean Gordon Bombay. Is it Gordon Bombay? Yeah, yeah. He's Mighty amazing. Ducks. But I mean, all right, here's one. Here's one. Creed, Rocky as a coach in Creed. Oh, don't think of him as a coach, but actually he is. That's right. That's a pretty good one. That's a deep cut. Not a really a deep cut, but a little sneaky. Yeah, that feels like a great answer. I, Eastwood, my first million reaction dollar baby? was to say, wait, say that again. Eastwood, million dollar baby. <laughs> Dude fucks up. He screwed up. <laughs> wait, I guess maybe now that I think about it, there's never been a bad coach in a sports movie. I love all of them. They're all great. It is true. They are like, yeah, every sports movie, like, what movie is it where like they just got to get rid of the coach or the coach? Oh, Varsity Blues. Oh, he's a bad yeah. dude. John Voight. Yeah. John Voight. Later, John Voight. The statue, the bird statue, like crops on him at the end. Your life. I don't want your life. Oh yeah. And is he? Is that the coach that he says that to, or is that just no, his dad? He's that's his, to dad. his dad. You're right. You're yeah. right. Okay, you're right. But the Very same. Smart. He's speaking up to authority. Exactly. Um, but football, football uh, media reminds me of Friday Night Lights. Oh. I think coach, coach Taylor, maybe the best coach Nate, in TV or film. Nate, I got to tell you, yeah, a hundred percent. And if you haven't seen yeah. Friday Night Lights, watch it, stream it. Skip season two, of course. That was the writer strike season. Don't don't even need yeah. to watch it. Uh, honestly, maybe one of the best television marriages, like on screen television couples, Connie Britton and um, whatever. What's his what Coach Taylor's name? Um, I forget Kyle, that actor. Uh, Chandler. Yep, Kyle Chandler. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. I love that. Great yeah. call. They get, they get through some tough times together, and it feels real. And they love each other, even though they, you know, they fight sometimes. Great call. Let's see. And he just cares about those kids, you know. Nate, I'm uh, loving. My other answer was going to be Atticus Finch, but he's a lawyer. He's not a coach at all. But just for some reason, that's <laughs> that's who I thought of from To Kill a Mockingbird. But you know what? If he was coaching his neighborhood little league team or something like that, Atticus Finch, oh, he would have been he'd great. be amazing, dude. Everyone would get in. Everyone would play. <laughs> you know, he'd take a no talent team all the way. Maybe they lose in the end, but they learn a lesson, and that's what really matters. Exactly. Um, exactly. Oh, I wanted to mention this. You talked about, or Aaron, real quick, weigh in on that. I want to hear what oh, you, what uh, you think. I just thought of uh, Walter Matthau as Buttermaker in oh, Bad yeah. News Bears. <laughs> uh, yeah, he's great. Just oh, another that. bad coach, I think, is uh, Steve Carell in Foxcatcher, that wrestling movie. You're right. He, like, <laughs> Definitely <laughs> a bad coach. <laughs> Real bad. Good call. Good call. I was watching Foxcatcher on an airplane. I was like looking around. I was like, is this okay? <laughs> <laughs> like in the middle seat. Um Real quick, Bowerman wrote a book. You mentioned get jogging, and you're about the Zen, and like his book. I, I forget what the title of it was, but like he basically started the jogging craze. Was was Bowerman because of his book? Yeah. And you wrote a book. Um, I did. Do you want to talk about it a little bit? It's called Not Quite a Genius Book, and I think maybe this is what kind of you know. Obviously, I love your comedy and what you do, and um, I think actually you maybe have been on a show out here when you were in L.A. that my buddy Dustin puts on called That's Huge. Um, oh, this yeah. was a while, a while, while back. Yeah. Um, awesome. but yeah, a little bit about your books. I want, you know, if anyone listening is looking for a great read, kind of people always DM me and ask for a rec and I'd say, let's go primary source right oh, here. Thanks. thanks so much. This one, it's a, it's called not quite a genius. It's a collection of essays and stories. So it's kind of a mix of first person memoir essays about my life. So kind of like, uh, David Sedaris style, mm -hmm. and then also just short humor pieces like you'd read in uh, McSweeney's or The New Yorker or something like that. So I think I have a piece in there about running that's something like, if I have to shit myself during this charity 5K, I'm just going to do it or something like that. <laughs> uh, and then a it kind of trot. pokes fun at a guy. Like as the piece goes on, you kind of get the feeling like, I think this dude wants to shit himself. <laughs> uh, like as a badge of, badge of red badge of courage or a brown badge of courage, as it were, uh, to kind of prove what a tough guy he is, which is kind of a weird thing. And like in marathon culture, sometimes like that'll happen. 
and people have like bloody nipples or they'll shit yeah. themselves and they'll finish the race anyway. And unless you're like going for a world record or you're going to win that race, I mean, just like, dude, just go to the porta potty. Like, <laughs> yeah, exactly, dude. What are you proving to who? I don't know. <laughs> if you're like, you'd run, like, I mean, the Boston Marathon's a tough marathon. Like, that's like you got to qualify for and be legit. But it's like, there's a lot of bathrooms in Boston. You know, they put out some port yeah. <laughs> porta potties too. And like, it, you know, they got some Duncans there. Just go for yeah, it. Yeah, you can cruise in there just to handle, but it's only going to shave a little off your time. But that's right. If you're going for a record, you just got to let go. Respect. Then respect. Yep. Yeah. I also hear that it's kind of nice to, you know, kind of carb load for those later miles. Like sometimes they'll hand out little like, not like not thimble size, but maybe like an ounce of beer or something like that just to get that in you to charge your body up. And that's I've just been, tough. I've done marathons where they've had never official, never, I've never had like an official aid station with beer, but I've done marathons where people do have like, um, little yeah exactly like the paper cups of beer for you to take i've never done it but i I could see that being appealing though yeah just for those carbs dude that's so ins doing a marathon good for you man i mean i i was recently running um my gf and i committed we're like for two weeks we're gonna run a mile every day and i, I oh, did feel the gains we, we didn't even time it we did a thing where we we're like whatever and she's faster than i am like in a sprint distance whatever like she'll kick my butt and uh but she was like i was like you can run faster if you want she's like no let's just do it together and uh I thought about like just honestly like about three minutes into the mile so for me like maybe a quarter of the way through uh just thinking of running a marathon dude the fact that you did that is unbelievable it's in such an insane feat it's crazy yeah it's funny it like it feels like a big deal but then if you do it it's just kind of like oh i exercise for a few hours like it's very achievable you know like i do think most people could do it if you if you wanted to. And I also completely respect the choice of anyone who does not want to do it. <laughs> totally. But I'm a big proponent of if you, if you wanted to, I think it's like an achievable thing and you can, you can run 10 minutes and then walk a minute and then run 10 minutes and walk a minute or, you know, whatever, like just to get through it. Um, get it now, done. now people are doing like ultra marathons and all this to try to like push themselves even further. Uh, there was just a, they just did a, a this race called the big, big yard ultra or the big backyard ultra hmm. where it's just a four mile loop and you have to start a new loop every hour and you can take as long as you want. So if you run it fast, you might get like 30 minutes of rest. If you run it a little slower, you'll get less rest and you just have to keep starting a loop. And the nice. winner did like 260 miles. It took three days. Um, but it was it, a woman won this woman named Courtney Doe Walter who's sponsored by Solomon and she's just a beast. Yeah. And it was just her and one other dude by the end and just them like dueling it out, starting new, new laps, um, every hour. That's and yeah, so run early. like ran 260 miles, like getting just kind of a few minutes of sleep here and there between laps. So all of that is just to say that the human mind can do amazing things. And that 260 miles, like 10 10 times as far as a marathon it's bonkers <laughs> dude that's insane and that's yeah that's so nuts and it's like that's like so evolved from the very yeah. like primitive like the first sports in recorded history obviously it makes sense like if you, there's like these cave paintings in france and it's like there's people depicted running in there and then there's also people depicted wrestling like those right. are the two oldest sports i mean because you don't need any equipment you just go out there and do it and it's just very much of like i'm gonna beat you from this point to this point or I'm going to take you and, and make you submit right here, you know, and right. it just goes it's back very to clear like, who the winner was in each case. Yeah. A hundred percent. Like there's no, uh, no like icing and hockey where you need a ref to be like, well, sorry, sorry guys that, uh, we gotta, we gotta do a face off. Dude, now. exactly. Yeah. Like what is this icing? I've been to a million hockey. Games. I'm like, what, what I, I keep looking <laughs> around for like someone to hand me a drink or something like I want, you know, cherry flavor or Coke flavor. Like what the hell is, <laughs> what the hell is that? But, uh, yeah, man, it's just so, it's so gnarly. Um, and also I wanted to just mention before, cause I know Nate has got to get cruising out because he's got, um, and we got a little more time. Cause I want to, I want to, uh, are you cool hanging out for until like, for like maybe 10 more minutes answering some writing questions? Great. Yeah. Sweet. Um, real quickly though, I want you to mention you've got a podcast too called the trying pod, right? Yeah. I just, I just started a podcast. It was, that was kind of my big quarantine uh, project nice. where I had started working on it right before, you know, the whole social distancing and pandemic and the COVID of it all happened. And I just wanted to talk to people about something they were trying to do. So the first episode, I talked to my buddy, Matt Kleinman, who's trying to grow and eat a ghost pepper in his backyard. Whoa. Um, 
and then I kind of put it on pause because the pandemic happened and I was like, I don't know when I'll be able to interview people again. And then like you're doing, people figured out you can do these interviews remotely. So I just got back into it and I've mm-hmm. got like six or seven episodes so far. And some of the episodes, someone talks about, um, trying to learn guitar. Someone else talks about, uh, trying to learn how to roller skate. Some of them are more serious. Like someone talks about trying to save the wolves, uh, Ooh, like working on an endangered species campaign. So yeah, it's been fun to do. And they're just like 30 minute conversations with people trying something new. That's great. I love that, dude. Yeah. That's, that's a, that's a great, um, great topic. And I'm all for trying new stuff, man. Get out there, you know, have a little bit of fun, mix it up, dude. And, uh, um, you know, I tried, um, I, mean, I don't know if I've tried anything new yet. I think running that mile was probably the newest thing that yeah, that's a great my GF thing. tried. Uh, yeah, keep it up. Always trying to, you know, get my dad to say he loves me. It'd be new for both of us, <laughs> you know, for him to say and me to feel, you know. I should, I should yeah. have you on the the pod. That could be your, yeah. that could be your <laughs> your topic. <laughs> I have to get clever about it. Get him to love me on his terms though, by like making more money and uh, you know, <laughs> like you know, holding a power Whatever position or something like that. Or yeah. I don't know how, or maybe honestly, I'd just be like, Hey dad, uh, you know, when you and mom used to argue, like I always felt like mom was kind of wrong. He might not love that, but he loved me. He'd love, he loved hearing that. <laughs> that would be the, the key to his heart to hear yeah, that, dude, yeah. <laughs> that validation. <laughs> no, me and my dad are solid, dude. Okay. I can wrestle him to the ground. Honestly, when you can wrestle your dad to the ground, like when you become that age, it does help your relationship of being like, I can pin my dad now. Like it's, so it helps. I had a... I had a similar moment in where I, I beat my dad in a race when I was like in high school, starting to get better at running. Cause he nice. was a marathoner. He was more of a cyclist, but he did running too, but just like a skinny fast guy. And, uh, I beat him in a race. Like he was just, we were walking the dog and he was like, Hey Nate, r- like race you to the top of the hill. And then he kind of took off and then I decided to chase him and then I beat him. And then I, I actually felt really sad. I like, <laughs> I, I was yeah. like, Oh no, like my dad's getting older yeah, and so am I and like life is changing and one day he'll be dead and like what is the meaning of this? Like it, it went from That's this like great. funny like, hey, we're racing and then it hit me like so heavy, so hard and I was like, oh no, I regret everything. <laughs> Winners, champions pay the price, man. Champions pay the yeah. price. That's a hilarious, that just shows your empathy and w- that you're a good guy and you got good vibes. And I think and that I do not have that same prefontaine like killers vibe or whatever that is. <laughs> I mean, who does, man? I don't even think like the guys in the um, just in case I think I don't want to let anybody know what happens in that 72 Munich games or whatever, because watch the movies. It's kind of fun if you don't know. And um, you can look it up. It's real easy. Um, but I think, Nate, so few of us do have that killer instinct. I mean, that, like yeah. he's truly one in a million having that. Which is why he's Prefontaine. Yeah, right? exactly right. And he's a true legend. So fire it up. Let's do a few cues and then um, you'll hop out of here. And uh, I set an alarm too. So even if the alarm goes off, in true running fashion, I set a timer. And when the timer happens... That's that's the gun. I'll just you're, go. Yep, you're out. Um, I have okay. a question. Yeah, what's up? If he's Prefontaine, then is everything since just Fontaine? Ooh. Uh, post-Fontaine. <laughs> Ooh. Fontaine yeah. could be a sweet you know, DJ name. I'm just Fontaine. I don't know what that'd be. DJ, like, DJ Fontaine. Your aesthetic would just be a fedora or something like that. Or like, you know, I don't know. I don't know. It's staying in though. It's not that funny, but I don't make cuts. Integrity <laughs> in podcasting. Huge. Strength in comedy. Underestimated. All right, here we go. Um, <laughs> let's see. Strider, dude. Stoke Lord. I could really use your advice. Listen, I'm 28 and my hairline is very unchill. I've got a bad widow's peak and a little tuft of hair in the front is a total island separating itself from the mainland. A classic Pangea <laughs> situation. So what's the move? Do I just shave, buzz it? Do I ride it out for a few more years? If you suggest shaving, buzzing it, could you list your top three baldies in history to possibly boost my stoke in this situation? You are a true chiller, my dog, late Blake. <sighs> I don't Good know. Question. What do you think? I mean, Nate, you've got great flow. You've got great flow, so I think... You know, you got I, for now. My grandpa was bald, so I think I hear that my mom's dad was bald. So I think that's who you you inherit that gene from. So I think it's going to go mm-hmm. one of these days. I think once it starts thinning out too much, I'm going to shave it. Yep. Um, maybe he could shave everything but the widow's peak tuft. Smart. So kind of like a reverse rat tail, just grow that out in the front, like a unicorn horn that's droopy. That's a good move. It's seldom done. It also looks wise, like some sort of wizard <laughs> would have that. 
Um, Monk like that's a good move. I could also say maybe do the B Franklin, which is like a mullet but bald. If he gets, although his is island up here, so he's not gonna have it in the back. So he, the B Franklin's not an option. I think maybe get jacked and just go Mister Clean, shave it, yeah. get on steroids. You have to you have to be very buff if you want to shave it and still like be yeah. attractive because then that's then you're doing like the um the rock basically you're going to shave it all off and just you have to look like Dwayne Johnson true you could if you aren't buff and maybe you're like a little you know skinny kind of um frail frame like you know maybe 5'10 buck 25 bald maybe you go ahead and get yourself one of those um grocery store um automatic shopping carts and just you know go around professor x style and just act like <laughs> that's you know, the other option yeah you got to know things you know look at people and just tell them what's going to happen to them later you know Developed be prescient yeah, exactly if that's in the cards all right here we go we're cruising um what up strider quick quest if you're meeting a potential gf for the first time do you hug shake hands or something okay so like a first date scenario what's the what's the what are the contact rules i would know well yeah, go for it. I, I don't know how I feel about like the shaking maybe limits romance. Um, I definitely wouldn't say go out and like give a hug. I mean, maybe like, especially like maybe like right when meeting, I wouldn't like just force that someone's hand like that. I would, I would just maybe, you know, good eye contact. What up? My name's Strider. How are you? Let's, um, I got us a table. Like, please have a seat, you know, like get there early. Um, I don't know. What do you think, Nate? I think that's, I think you're exactly right. These, these days, if it was a first date during COVID times right. and you're doing like some outdoor dining, I would probably do like an awkward joke about like, oh, can't, can't hug. Like, and then do like a fake elbow thing from like six feet away. Smart. And like make an awkward joke about it. Very smart. That's a great move. Use <laughs> the time. Be, it's a zeitgeist move. That's Nate. Great freaking call. Great call. <laughs> Funny, charming, shows the personality good. Aaron, what do you got? You got any... Um, well, I was just thinking, friends? adding on to what Nate said, like, I guess now it's, like, so much easier to know if the girl's interested because she's like Johnny Carson calling you over to the couch. Like, oh, if she allows right. you within six feet, it's like, oh, it's on. That's a good call. Yeah. That's a huge... You're right. You're right. That's a huge indicator. That's an amazing call. All right, I got one more, and this is kind of directed at Aaron. I saved it. Um, and Nate, I'd like you to weigh in on this too. Hey dude, Please. I had to reach out and say something. Does Aaron know how much you can customize your in and out? Like some extra crunch in your fries, order them well done in a hurry, order your meat medium rare and it will be out faster. Need more salt on your fries? I, I'm reading that as if he's frustrated. Uh, use the complimentary <laughs> salt packets and salt them up. There is an exclamation after that. I used to work at In-N-Out and I can t okay, tell you they use the highest quality potatoes and peel new ones multiple times a day. For maximum freshness so nate just a little bit like aaron doesn't like in and out for some reason I don't oh care. no um what's what's your uh we'll answer this question but what's your go-to burger in that realm like you know in and out water burger uh shake what do they have out in, in new york shake shack shake shack which is dank yeah shake shack five guys in and out i'm thinking of in like a similar world i'm actually i think in and out i really love thank um, you i knew see yeah, I, and I also I have it quite seldom because I'm not in California that often. So when I get it, it's kind of like a treat, mm -hmm. and I look forward to it. Um, so I might I could see getting sick of it, but but right now I love it. Yeah, love that. That's a, uh, honestly there is no correct answer, but that's correct. Um, <laughs> Aaron, what's going on, dude? Do you know about these options that you can do? A, I'm not in your special club. I don't wear your special underwear. I don't know what this menu is. <laughs> I have been informed. Uh, since I've been working on going deep, and that is very helpful. Uh, the salt packets, uh, yeah, I, I can do this job, so I am not blind. Uh, no offense to those who are and are listening to podcasts. But, yeah, I, I'm aware that you can put salt on fries. It's just at every other restaurant, you don't have to, which is the beautiful Whoa. thing. I'm paying Whoa. for food. Across the bell. I don't want to have to decorate them. <laughs> Respect. Aaron stands where he stands. That dude's name was Christian. There you have it. And Nate... My alarm went off, 5.55. You are going to go do work. You are a working man. Dude, good luck um, on everything. Thanks for having me. Of course, so dude. so much fun. Thank you so Love much. The pod. Dude, thank you so much for coming on, man. It's, it's a true treat. Um, hopefully, you know, you can come back on and we can talk about more stuff. I always love when you, you brought Steve Prefontaine into my world and then we spread it out. So 
any subject matter you have, um, check out Nate's podcast, Trying Pod, and pick up his book, Not Quite a Genius. Dude's a beast. Um, thank you, Nate. Thanks so much, man. Thanks again, man. Later, Strider. Later, Aaron. Peace. Bye. Thanks, bro. That was sick, dude. What a legend, dude, you know? It's always nice to have good vibes, dude. He came in, dropped some knowledge. He's got work. He squeezed he squeezed it the time in, dude. Um, Aaron, my bad, dude. I, I had to sort of set you up with that in and out question, dude. <laughs> no problem. Sometimes I love to jab you. You know, I got, I'm sick. Here's the thing. I'm a sick puppy. <laughs> I'm a sick little puppy. You know, I'm over here. Oh, dude, Strider's chilling, dude. He's, you know, he's throwing out some good vibes. And you know what? I do have some good vibes. But guess what, dude? There's something cooking under the surface. There's always something cooking in this kitchen, and a lot of times it's a potion. It's not always a dank casserole. Sometimes I'm cooking up something sick, and I'm going to serve it out when you least expect. And you got to take a bite, baby. And Aaron, I had to have you take a bite there, baby. So sorry about that. Sorry about that, dude. But <laughs> you, you freaking stuck to your guns, and that's what's up. Test passed. I mean, that's all I can do. That's all I have. You're a beast, dude. You know, you, you, you know what you like. I want to. Here's the thing. It's like we're in a relationship and and when you get in a relationship you can't bank on wanting to change that person yep i'm very much banking on wanting to change you <laughs> but <laughs> you know like if you had an in and out burger you wouldn't be like no like uh like if the office ordered in and out they're yeah. like oh hey the manager's like hey dude i got in everyone in and out burgers today like, totally are yeah. you gonna still eat your own lunch that you no that day? no no absolutely not the burger's yeah. fine i've never had a problem with the burger I, I don't like the secret menu aspect of it, but whatever. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's the fries are absolute garbage. Yeah. They're not the best. Yeah. You know, I everyone, mean, McDonald's has the best fries. Everyone knows it. It's sure. okay. There's nothing wrong with that. It's true. It's imperfections that make perfection. I will try the well done, though. I will definitely. I'm definitely. My GF gets the well I done. I want to explore it. My GF gets the well done. She likes them. Um, Sick, dude. All right, dude. Well, freaking Nate Dern, Steve Prefontaine. The dude's a beast, man. The dude stuck up for what he believed in. He's a front runner, dude. Bowerman was like, dude, no, no, you can do. He did want, Prefontaine wanted to be a miler. And Bowerman's like, no, own the 5,000. Prefontaine says, no one cares about the 5,000. It's the three mile race. Guess what, dude? He made everyone care. The guy sticks to his guns. He has guts. He's, it's, you know, he's got some great co quotes that saying when he's going into the Olympics. Let me find it here. He says, uh, it's freaking amazing. Also, dude, little factual here, dude. Nike, the Bowerman's company, it's uh, Nike's the Greek god of speed and victory. Uh, freaking dank lady that also had three sisters. Zelos, the, the god of zeal and power. Bick, which I love, dude. Uh, the god of force, dude, not the god of pens. And Kralos, the god so of strength. Lighters. Yeah, dude, light and lighters, dude, you have Bick. Um, seriously, dude, like I remember in high school, it was always popular for dudes that like just figured out weed and like had like one little glass piece. They would always take Bic lighters and like burn themselves with it. And they're like, oh yeah, dude, I bic myself. Uh, and I was okay. like, what? I don't want that, dude. My brother did that, dude. I was like, aggressive, dude. What's up, bros? I'm a cutter. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. It's like, well, it's like, I can handle this, dude. Look out. <laughs> Gnarly. What are you, Mr. Joshua? <laughs> exactly, Leave dude. Leave the weapon reference. Yeah. Oh, beast. What a dank movie, dude. Yep. I want to find Pre's... He's got a great, great quote. Basically, he says, though, he's like, the way I'm going to run this race is it's going to be an all-guts race. You know, because there is strategy. And like we mentioned, like with Nate saying, just having wearing a lighter article of clothing or even slight posture changes can shave 10 seconds. And these races are decided by less than a second sometimes, generally two to three seconds. And um, he's just like, nah, dude, I'm not timing it. It's going to be an all-out guts race. I'm keeping the pace up. And if anyone's going to beat me, it's because they got more guts and no one's got more guts than me. It's badass, dude. Freaking badass, dude. Um, yeah, dude, I mean, that's about it. Oh, maybe a little bit of personal history, which I didn't get to, sort of reverse style, dude, in case anyone's wondering. My GF and I did just road trip it across the country, cruised Route 66, historic route, back from Chicago to um, L.A. Drove through, um, let's see, went through St. Louis, Dank City. Go Cards. Go Cards. Can't, can't, I'm saddened that you weren't able to make it out to the stadium this year, Aaron. But I drove by the stadium and mm -hmm. it looks dank. You're yeah. gonna, you're gonna like that. Cool. Um, went through Tulsa, Oklahoma. Not much going on, but had a nice sandwich. Went through Albuquerque. Loved it, dude. Went through Amarillo. Actually, before Albuquerque, 
Also, not much going on on the Panhandle. Um, but uh, Albuquerque, beautiful, dude. Mexico, New Mexico, the land of enchantment, beautiful. Went through Flagstaff. I'm, I'm big on Flagstaff, dude. Might want to have my fantasy draft, in-person draft party there next year for my fantasy league. Dank city, dude. Dank city. Hiking. Went to the G Canyon. Saw elk. You ever seen an elk, Aaron? I have not. Elk are big. Yeah, that's what I've heard. It's not a deer, dude. It's a mm. difference. I thought an elk was a deer. Me and my GF rented bikes. The dude renting out the bike was like, do not approach the... Like, he literally made you think the elk were going to, like, murder you. Like, like they had it out for you. He's like, do not approach the elk. They do are. not make eye contact with him. They will get you. Yeah. They are, they are being hunted by Joe Rogan, and they are super pissed about it. <laughs> <laughs> I can see where you'd feel more manly killing... Like, dude, honestly, the rule of hunting should be, like, if you can, if you can get a blade, like a knife, and you can go up and slit an elk's throat, then you should be able to kill and eat that elk. You know what yeah. I mean? Maybe a bow. A bow's legit. A compound bow. Yeah. I could see that. It's got to be a fair fight. Yeah. You know, the camera, using technology. Think about the baseball thing. Everyone gets mad about that. Why in hunting? We're not hearing the elk's opinion, mm -hmm. you know? And speaking of, like, the the dude riding the bike was like, you're lucky it's not mating season. If it was, the elks would be extra aggressive. He's like, if they do chase you, run. It's like, it's not like bears. Run. You know, they'll, they'll chase you out of the area. They'll be fine. You know, bears is like, that's prey and stuff. They'll, they'll want to kill you like a, or like a mountain lion or whatever. But an elk will just be like, get out of here. Which is kind of, you know, it's nice, you know. Also with their mating, like, you know, elks will like hit each other with their, their antlers. They grow them for that to like get their mating thing going and like win the territory where the females will be. And then the other elk like, but it's never really to the death. They'll kind of just be like, oh, I'm out of here. But then sometimes they get tangled and they, they will die. They'll die. Yeah. They'll yeah. die so they can bone. I like that he's like, you're lucky. It's like, uh, no, I came here at a specific time of year, so it's not the rut. True. I mean, I got lucky. Aaron, I got to tell you, I got lucky. There <laughs> might be people that do know that. And I got lucky with weather, too. It was October. It was like 75. Me and my GF were stoked. We were lucky, dude. I know, but it's just like, it's a, it's only a certain time of year. It's like every other time of the year is, oh, you're just lucky? No. It's, yeah, exactly. It's a seasonal thing. We did cruise by there on our bikes and see like tourists taking selfies five feet away. Like I was freaked out. I saw one elk. I was like, it's going to kill me. It know it's like it knows I'm looking. The elk's gonna get me, dude. Yeah. How many people in Yellowstone get killed every year from fucking taking photos of bison? Totally, totally. Like, you're yeah. an idiot. And bison and elk are the same. They kind of have same dispositions. Like they're not like. Um, they might be totally different. I'm acting. I'm, I'm talking here like I'm an expert. Like I know fucking an elk named Jerry and a bison named Tim, and like that they're <laughs> chill. <laughs> but I know when watching freaking the Yellowstone Channel on National Geographic, that when it comes to mating time. They don't just try to kill each other. They just kind of, they freaking hit each other with their heads. They flex on each other. And then they're like, all right, dude, you seem more alpha. I'm out. I'm going to bounce. If I was a freaking elk or a bison, like, I just have to be a voyeur. I'm soft. I'd cruise up and be like, dude, can I just watch and honestly drill myself, dude, while you, you know, keep our species going? Is that chill? I'm kind of into watching. And then he'd be like, oh, I guess I'm a bit of an exhibitionist lover. Fine. That'd be the only way I could survive. As an elk or a bison. Like, take notes, bro. Yeah. <laughs> exactly, dude. Um, have you ever done a big road trip, Aaron? Uh, we did We did drive. We did um, Phoenix and Flagstaff and uh, Sedona last July 4th. Nice. That That's was, a good. That was super fun. That's a great one. I mean, we try, when I got to Flagstaff, I was like, and that was like two hours away, I think, from Sedona. Mm -hmm. uh, Sedona was the major, major destination where we were at but like okay. i was like fuck how far god the grand canyon's still like two hours away like oh yeah it's still two hours and then it'd be another four hours back to sedona it was like nah, i know i want to go so early. bad but it's just it's just out of reach from from la even it is it's about it's a full seven and a half eight hours and yeah. but dude it's it is freaking grand dude like there's a reason it's called grand like that you get there you've seen it in a million photos you've seen it on postcards you've seen it on your background on your computer or whatever mm -hmm. flown over it you've flown over your captain said look out of the right you see the grand guy you know there it's about three more miles to a touchdown in denver and dude it's it's just it's unbelievable how big it is dude it is unbelievable and we only saw the southern tip you know like that's that's it dude it is literally 
and here's the thing, Aaron, I'm going to tell you right now, I did some research, mm -hmm. and this might be, you know, counter to, you know, I would say mainstream science, but people say it's, oh, it's formed over millions of years ago, and the plate tectonics, and, you know, then the, the rivers converged, so that's why... Erosion. Yeah, and, and erosion and such, but really it was just... Um, Marisi f plopped out his hog there, <laughs> you know, a while back. He just plopped it out. Now we got the Grand Canyon, dude. Honestly, dude, if you need to cross the Grand Canyon, Marisi's just got to get wood, and then you can just cross. Yeah. It's I about mean, 60 it, miles wide. The Marianas Trench, you know, he, he just dove in the Pacific and... Yeah, he went for a swim. That's where it was. I mean, it was where it landed. True story. Mount Everest, dude, just one of his nuts. <laughs> 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 I love it. And in that pod with a little bit of dong talk, guys, Nate Dern was our guest today. He's a beast. Steve, Pronte Steve Prefontaine is a true epic legendary beast. Um, check out his movie for his full story. I don't want to give it all away, um, but it's great, man. He was just true, true guy, stood up for what he believed in. You know, somebody, if you're a hero, if you're in high school and you're looking to write a college essay or write an SAT essay, SAT freaking essay, and you need like someone to, you know, map it out over. When you get your question, Prefontaine's a good one to go to. You know, he's a good one to have. So um, keep being a beast. Aaron, thank you. Any, anybody writing any corrections or suggestions or questions, striderwilsontreads at gmail.com and friggin' stay stoked, dudes. <laughs>